Yeah, you saw that coming. <laughs> yeah, I saw that coming. Um, so I had, I sat down this morning and I don't mean to kind of, I'm just kind of jump in with some of the things that I was thinking about because I wanted to write down as much information as I could that I knew or that I had thought about and that's been sitting in my head. And I thought maybe I would just talk to you a little bit about what women's sports, the history of it, generally speaking, in this country. Sure. And I think one of the major differences, of, of course, is that cricket, I understand, is the most major sport in India. Is that correct? Yep. By far. Okay. Whereas it's not on the radar at all where, you know, in the United States. So I would start by saying that team sports specifically have been dominated in the U.S. by men's sports. Mm -hmm. And the four major team sports in the United States historically are football, which is, of course, American football, yeah. pigskin, basketball, baseball, and hockey would probably bring up the, the caboose of that train. Um, soccer is not considered one mm -hmm. of the four major American sports, despite what many people have been screaming about for decades. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, the four major sports in the U.S. are football, basketball, baseball, and hockey. Hmm. Um, and, you know, that the dominance of those sports has come in, in every form, right? Financially, uh, the visibility of them, um, participation. Women did not, did, not in, did not participate in many of those sports for decades and decades. Um, politically, federal legislation, and, um, you know, just the language and enforcement of, ge of gender roles, which is that women don't play sports. Um, it's not what women do, it's not feminine. And, you know, of course, young girls and even young women to a large extent didn't have the, voc don't have the vocabulary to understand that gender roles along with the ideas of masculine and feminine are constructs really designed to keep people in their place. Um, and that's been used a lot with, you know, keeping women out of sports. So I guess not just in the United States, but all, all over the world, you know, the very act of playing sports as women is a challenge to societal norms. Yeah. But um, so I would say also that the, I have it down here. So of those four sports, first of all, girls don't play football. They have it in this country. And I mean that in the sense of not having, you know, teams organized or leagues organized for them at the youth level. They do not play in high school. They still do not play at the high school level in the U.S. They are, you know, some girls play on the boys football team, but there are no high school girls football teams. Which is so interesting to me. I mean, how, why? I mean, it's the biggest sport. It's like your most visible sport. Right. I, all that conversation around Super Bowl. And I'm like, where's the women's football, you know, uh, American football thing? I mean, there's nothing. There, women play rugby. So there's nothing to stop women from playing this kind of a, a very physical contact sport. They have, they have played in the past. Actually, there was, there was a book recently published called Hail Mary by... Uh, Oh my goodness, Lindsay D'Archangelo and I'm blanking on the name of this of the second author, but they wrote it in tandem and it was about like the first women's professional football league back in like the seventies. Um, and it's, it is still considered, I mean, I guess like everything else, women have had to create their own space to do things. So they, they, they played obviously, but it wasn't, something that you could pursue professionally or make a career out of um and football is still the least penetrable american sport for women um two years ago uh, a, a girl named a woman named sarah fuller was a kicker on the vanderbilt football team and that was like a massive massive story she was the first woman to appear on a power five uh football team and for context, and, uh, what, what what football team is this? I mean, what is Vanderbilt? Is it a college? So they 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 yeah they're a university. Okay. They're a Division One university. Um, so yeah, our college structure is also really 
intense. We our athletics are broken up in by division one, division two, II, division three. There's you know junior associations and et cetera, et cetera. That's a that's a whole research project in and of yeah. itself. But um, Vanderbilt is a major division one uh, FBS football program, mm. and she was the first to to appear in such on such a team. Um, and you know we there are leagues that are around. You know I I know. Um, I know a woman probably eight, eight years older than me who coaches. She's the only female high school football coach in my home state of Connecticut. Mm-hmm. Um, she has played professionally throughout around New England, but it was, you know, they drove themselves to the games. They got their own equipment. So I guess it depends on how you define professional. I mean, certainly if you're watching the NFL on Sunday in the U.S., that's far and away anything that has been achieved by women playing that sport ever Mm -hmm. and I'm not sure that I will see it in my lifetime frankly Um, so football is football is the most is the outlier you know the rest of the sports and baseball I would say women don't play baseball women play softball yeah Uh, I'm I don't say I'll actually know the history of the birth of the sport of softball but I I imagine that it has something to do with the fact that women weren't allowed to play baseball. So we just sort of did what we always do and made our own sport. Um, (laughs) I'd have to look, I'd have to look into that for you, but so major league baseball and the national football league are strictly men's sports in this country. Women Mm -hmm. do not participate. The only way they do participate, you may be privy to Uh over the last couple of years are in coaching positions. Okay. So they're starting to break, they're starting to break in um, as assistant coaches and scouts and, um, just last year, a woman named Kim Ng, K-I-M, last name is, I believe, N-G. She was hired by the Miami Marlins as the first ever female GM in Major League Baseball in the U.S. So that's where we're infiltrating, for lack of a better word. We can't participate on Major League Baseball teams or uh, NFL teams, but we are um, making ourselves known uh, on the sidelines, which is previously not something that we ever did up until up until a couple of years ago, um, the role of women in men's sports in the U.S. has always been, if anything, in sports media, mm. or generally speaking, as accessories to the men who are participating. So, for instance, as cheerleaders on the sideline, um, as, a, as, as a sideshow to the main event, mm. or even in, even in sports media, they were, you know, we have been sideline reporters, which are obviously not the main reporter. Yeah. or even in, in studio productions, we're seen sort of as the second, third, or fourth voice on the panel and always dressed to the nines to cater to the straight male audience that watches right. sports. Right. So there really isn't room, or hasn't been room for us in men's sports to really be the focus. Mm. And that's where women's sports have have really been the only place that has allowed us to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, It goes back to probably the 70s. I mean, in 1972, Billie Jean King won the US Open in tennis. And she won $15,000 less than the male champion and threatened the USTA that if the prize money was not equal next year, she wouldn't participate. Mm -hmm. And wouldn't you know, in 1973, the prize money was equal. And that very same year, probably the most, probably the biggest, I don't want to say event, but I'll, I'll use the word event. I'll let you use, I'll let you figure out a bigger, a better word. Um, biggest event for the game changer in women's sports in the U.S. was Title IX, which was in 1972. Okay. Uh, are you, are you, have you heard of Title IX? Are you familiar with it? No, I'm not familiar okay. with it. Okay. Uh, I think Amy. women's sports, well, yeah, women's sports history in the U.S. probably, now that I'm speaking, can be broken up into two areas prior to 1972 and after 1972. Mm-hmm. Title IX is a, a civil rights legislation. Okay. Um, it's a federal civil rights law in the U.S. that was passed to prohibit sex-based discrimination in any school. Mm-hmm. And largely what that has done in the years since is that it has forced institutions to look at how they invest their money in athletic programs. So prior to 1972, they could put all their money towards men and, not, and, not, and nothing towards women. Now it was actually a federal law that they could not do that. 
Right. So since 1972, they've been schools have been investing more and more money into their women's programs. Mm -hmm. um, so girls were for the first time allowed to go to college on sports scholarships. They were not allowed to do that prior to 1972 in Title IX. Wow. Um, yeah. And in turn, as you would imagine, once those scholarships and that investment kind of opened up participation across the country and across lots of sports just totally skyrocketed over the last 50 years. Yeah. Yeah. The 70s is a big, 70s is a big time. We, you know, 1974 was, they passed the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, which is not directly related to sport, but that was the first time that women in the United States could get their own credit cards without a man co-signing and allowing them to do that. Um, so again, it's not directly, effect, direct, directly connected to sports, but in a sense it is because it has a lot to do with, you know, women taking back control of another aspect of their life. Right. That they, previous, that they previously didn't have. So those are the big things in the 70s. And then it just sort of kind of, from the 70s and the 80s, it was sort of, I'm sorry, what you say? I was just saying it's been growing ever since. I mean, uh, the way that women's sport has grown in the US, uh, I look at uh, some of the sports leagues in the U.S. as you know, a few decades advanced as to what women's sport is in India, uh, because there are so many of these barriers, especially societal barriers, which uh, are just a lot deeper, a lot stronger. Education levels aren't the same, makes such a difference. So, um, almost a picture of you know what, where women's sport could be, where Indian women's sport could be in another ten years. I look at the U.S. What's happening there? Right and. Uh, if you look at, if you kind of put Title IX in its own corner, it obviously needed men to pass that um, in, con in collaboration with women. And then 20 or so years later, so 1996, the WNBA was launched. And so the WNBA is the first, to my knowledge, um, I was born in 89. So 96, WNBA is the first women's professional sports league that was launched in the United States, team sports league. Mm. Um, and it was done so with the incredible aid of, you know, male allies. David Stern, who was the commissioner of the N NBA at that time, mm. was a huge, huge proponent of the WNBA. He wanted it to happen. He believed in it. And it came right on the heels of the 1996 Olympics, mm -hmm. which was huge for United States for a number of reasons. One being we hosted it. So it had a lot of engagement, it took place in Atlanta, Georgia. And four major women's sports teams all won gold. Softball, basketball, soccer, hardcore volleyball, I believe, and also beach volleyball. I'm pretty okay. sure. So it was just gold medal after gold medal after gold medal. Yeah. Um, so 96 is sort of the second big year in women's sports history. And, you know, the WNBA came after and the 1999 World Cup came after, but 96 is really where everything started. Interesting. Interesting to see how much the Olympics can drive um, this kind of a movement, especially with context to cricket is, you know, making a push for inclusion in the Olympics. And everyone acknowledges that, you know, the biggest gainers will be women's cricket and cricket outside the top countries. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it is great. It is great to find out the kind of the origin story of the origin of the WNBA. Right, and the right. other, I think, most important thing to point out is that prior to 1996, women, I don't believe, competed in those sports oh. in the Olympics. I don't think we were allowed. Let me double check that right now. Okay. So 96 is like, I would say, 1972 and 1996 are big, big, big deal. <laughs> Pretty sure. Oh, you know what? Let me do this instead. I know for a fact that was the first year women's basketball 
because that's the first time we ever had a U.S. Uh, women's national team. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. History, women, we always have our own category. The first women's tournament was staged at the 1976 Summer Olympics. Blah, blah, blah. Next two tournaments. 96 was the first of its current 12 team format. Okay. Interestingly enough, the US has won every single gold medal since then. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, so yeah, the WNBA, yeah, so the WNBA is, I mean, it's a fascinating. Um, tournament because it's one of the uh, most successful women's sports leagues in the world and it has very almost deliberately taken um, its own path it has from my understanding a very unique model where a few of the teams are completely independently owned completely independent of the NBA and there are a few teams which are like uh, core teams with existing NBA teams uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm really curious to, see, to know how that came about. I wonder, I mean, if uh, you know anything of the uh, that time when the WNB started, whether there was any thought of aligning the WNBA to the existing NBA uh, structure uh, or why they decided to kind of um, have uh, this independent existence and now this hybrid structure. I do uh, know that uh, the WBL was actually the first professional basketball league that we had here, but the WNBA, its major distinction is that it was the first to be fully backed by the NBA. That's what has set it apart. Mm -hmm. And I don't know the detailed history of the league. It recently celebrated 25 years. It is the longest running professional sports, women's professional sports league in this country. Mm. Um, women, women's soccer has had, off the top of my head alone, three. They started the WUSA in the late nineties off the heels of the success of the women's national soccer team mm -hmm. um, that folded. Then we had the WPS that folded. Now we have the NWSL. Um, so the WNBA and the now NWSL women's professional soccer are really interesting to look at side by side mm -hmm. in terms of one that was really backed by its male league counterpart and one that has really just been trying to stay afloat by its own <laughs> you know, will over the last 25 years or so. Right. Um, so even just those sports leagues would be a really interesting case study. Yeah. Um, let me look at some stuff while you're kind of jotting things down, because I do, I do know that these teams were backed by them, but we've had so many teams that have folded over the tw over 25 years. I mean, there's like six or six or seven there's like six or seven original franchises that no longer exist. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think part of that is just that the markets didn't work. Part of that is that they invested too much. You know, part of it is um, they invested too little or it's just been a lot of, I think the, the other piece of perspective to look at with women's sports in side by side with men's sports is just how much longer they've been around. Yeah. And while it may seem bad or not so great that a lot of teams in the WNBA, for example, have kind of folded and died and come back and died and come back. It's only 25 years old, mm. which is not a long time. Yeah. It seems like it's a long time for us because it's all that we have to attach yeah. ourselves to in our, in our small history. But, you know, if I spend a half hour right now, say, huh, looking at, the origins of the NBA, like how many teams in the forties didn't, didn't last. I don't know. Yep. Um, are they all the same teams? We know for a fact they're not right. So there's a little bit of, there's a little bit of perspective in there. I think that we need to take into consideration, but in terms of financial structures, let me, let me look at this. I think we can uh, probably, I mean, uh, revisit this, uh, at some point, uh, one of the, um, so like you said, it's very interesting to look at the WNBA side by side with the women's soccer league right now. But one similarity between those two is that they're not uh, aligned to, they're not 
aligned from the start to the existing men's leagues. Um, yes. And, and I, I wonder whether that's, um, you know, a deliberate choice. And it's very different from what I see happening in the rest of the world. Like a comparison is with uh, the professional soccer, uh, professional football situation in the UK, where most of your uh, male English English Premier League teams have counterpart women's teams aligned within the same. You have Arsenal women, Chelsea women, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So all your top teams are teams which have existing men's structures. And I see personally a lot of advantage in there are disadvantages also, of course. But uh, just in terms of the brand visibility, recognize uh, you know the uh, recall for the fans, and therefore tapping into an existing fan base. It seems like a no-brainer to me, and that's that's the approach I take with the IPL. That uh, you absolutely must align women's teams to the existing men's teams. It, must be the existing men's teams who get first opportunity to build women's teams. Um, but I see a very different approach in the US. And I just wanted to uh, get your perspective on that as to which, how do you, what do you think are the strengths of, uh, strengths and weaknesses of both approaches? Well, the strength would be the fact that I'm still watching WNBA games 25 years after the league started. Um, and that comes from the support of the National Basketball Association. I look at, I look at even just recently, there's been a lot of development in the Women's Super League over in England in the, with it, probably since COVID within the last like two years mm-hmm. in terms of investment and development and um, growing. There's times I look at those, those teams and I think, man, if they just operated by themselves, they'd get so much farther faster. Because they wouldn't have to, they wouldn't have to appeal to male bureaucracies that, generally speaking, only look at them as ways to continue to line their pockets and not as actual, um, and not as an investment in just simply having, giving opportunities for women to play sports. Mm-hmm. That's not what their that's not what their um, that's not what their bottom line is, um, and we continue to see that more and more in the U.S. Um, how we have, you know, man, there's so many different components to this. So there's Angel City FC is a new, a newer expansion team in the NWSL. Okay. They are primarily, they are primarily backed by female ownership group. Okay. They have owners that are former U.S. Women's National Team players, including Mia Hamm and Julie Foudy and Abby Wambach, um, American actresses. Jennifer Garner, Natalie Portman. Mm-hmm. And you're seeing a really interesting strategy for you know women doing something on their own terms by themselves. And what is this team and franchise going to look like in five years, mm-hmm. having not had to sit in the boardroom and convince a bunch of middle-aged men that they matter? They haven't had to do that <laughs> at all. <laughs> um, and how fast are they going to grow because of it? And mm-hmm. what are they going to look like? And how far are they going to reach because of that? You know, I think that that's a major question. And yeah. it's hard to tell in the WSL because I believe all of those teams are backed by the men. Mm-hmm. So it just becomes, a, it becomes, you know, how much are you willing to give us? You're constantly having to ask for more. You're constantly having to prove your worth. And it's all based on money. It's not based on people who are looking at them and saying, we want, we want to give these women exactly what they deserve. It's not about that. It's about how much money they can make off of them. And that's not right or wrong. It's just where they're coming from. Yep. And I mean, to be clear, the investors in Angel City FC also want to make money, <laughs> but, they're do- but they're doing it on their own terms. And what we're seeing now in the United States is that we don't need to convince men in boardrooms to do stuff when it comes to professional sports, we can just, we can do it on our own. There are enough women in this country with money who care that want to invest. And that's, that's like the next phase of this whole thing that we're seeing. But you have me interested in all of this now. I actually just found an old New York Times article from 2000. Mm -hmm. Says WUSA and MLS agree to cooperate on women's league. Yeah, I mean, 
Uh, your perspective is absolutely uh, spot on in terms of, you know, there are going to be, if you have this alignment, there are going to be these natural challenges where you have an existing men's structure run by men, run for men, run from with a very uh, certain point of view. Uh, and I'm, I mean, like you said, it's not right or wrong sports uh, entertainment, sports is business. a entertainment business uh, right. and making money is an important part of the discussion. Uh, and that's the perspective. And yes, women's sport does need to be approached differently. It needs to be looked at differently with uh, uh, a slightly longer term lens and a longer term investment horizon. Uh, but but I'm comparing it like my vantage point. Okay, someone who grew up in um, the 90s in India, was, when was the first time that the NBA was shown in India? Um, and I could join yeah, so the NBA was shown in India and I remember watching uh, the Chicago Bulls of the late 90s with Michael Jordan and the San Antonio Spurs. I remember a quiz question where I actually got it right, where they actually won something. <laughs> and I keep, yeah. yeah, and I keep thinking, uh, if the WNBA existed in, you know, uh, along with the NBA or, you know, and the same teams as the NBA, Chicago Bulls men, Chicago Bulls women, and they had shown a Chicago Bulls women match. Would I have started watching and would I have maybe gotten into the sport because I'm already a Chicago Bulls kind of fan um, and therefore would I catch on faster whereas uh, whereas right now, I mean the WNBA doesn't exist for me. It's been uh, only men's sport which has been shown in India. Of course, that's the problem. It doesn't exist because they, ha they haven't shown it and now I can watch it independently. But I don't follow WNBA uh, as much as I'm aware of the NBA having had that presence for the last 20 years. And I just wonder, looking at Australia, the way they're doing their cricket and the way they're aligning their cricket right off the bat. And I think they're a country who do it well in terms of not patronize the women's presences in their teams, especially in their uh, big bash, the women's big bash cricket teams, where they really have given women an equal platform and they have subscribed to that philosophy of one club, two teams. And I really wonder if uh, whether the WNBA would have been a, a much bigger global product uh, than it is now, uh, if there was that alignment. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, it's hard to it's hard to say whether it's hard to say that more investment wouldn't you know wouldn't hurt. Of course, it would. Um, but there's also the conversation about exposure, mm -hmm. right? Which is that the WNBA has existed for 25 years, but we still can't watch you know games on television. <laughs> it's still. It's still like uh, searching a tre on a treasure map to try and figure out where I can stream certain games. You know, the, the media broadcasts and the broadcast rights are still dominated by men's sports. Hmm. And one other factor in this country that's different from other countries is just how popular our collegiate athletics are. Like yeah. college sports here are a major, major business. Yeah. And, you know, we're a country with 50 states. All of those states don't have major metropolitan areas. Mm -hmm. So in states like Missouri and Alabama and mostly the deep South and in the, and in the West, Wyoming, Montana, mm -hmm. these states live and breathe their college sports because okay. it's what they have. So we're not only competing with men's professional sports, we're competing with college sports. Uh, so, oh yeah, it's, it's, it's insane here. College sports is a huge huge deal it's a huge huge money maker mm -hmm. and um looking at college sports in a really really you know petri dish 1972 we were first allowed to get scholarships as female athletes mm -hmm. 2021 almost 50 years later um a set of laws went into effect last july that are called nil which is yeah. name image and likeness so 49 years later we are now allowed to make money as college as college athletes that's how big the business is yeah. Right. Which seems kind of strange um, to other countries, because by the time that people are 18 in Europe, for example, they're already professional, whereas mm. we are not. Yeah. There are there are laws and rules in place that sort of force us to go to college. We can't mm. just become professional athletes. Um, but that's changing now, too. So the exposure is a big thing. And I had a conversation um, a couple months ago. With a girl named Shannon Scoville, who's doing her PhD 
um, right now. She's focusing on like gender equality in, in media and in sports media. And she, she said something so profound to me, which is that interest comes from exposure. Yeah. So as you were referencing, um, you know, Michael Jordan a couple of minutes ago, if you're exposed to a story or an athlete or a sport, you are going to be interested in that because it becomes part of your everyday life, which is like me as an eight-year-old girl on a weekend, I was only watching the NFL because that's all that was on and all that my dad wanted to watch. There were no women's sports to watch at all. Um, but, and it, you know, whatever we see on ESPN or Fox Sports or on YouTube, that's just, it's socially constructed. Hmm. That interest is socially constructed. So if you cover women's cricket more often, if you show it more often, well, then it just becomes part of your everyday language and you're going to talk about it. Yeah. So that's, I'm trying to think about how we may break, may break this down, but there's the financial side of it. There's the visibility side of it. There's the societal part of it, which is yeah. I think language, language and gender. And um, there is, I think there was a fourth one I was thinking about before. And there's the participation aspect. Like what are the infrastructures in place for girls to actually play these sports? Yeah. Do they exist? And do they reach a certain level and just stop? What's the next step? And that's always sort of been what it is for us is there's no next step. You have to find some other job. And it still is like that. There are professional athletes in this country that play in the NWSL, mm. which is one of the premier women's sports leagues in the world and still have to work other jobs. That's crazy. So isn't it crazy? Yeah, it really is. That's why for so many years, you know, it's, Arata and I have spoken about this before. I was telling her, you know, the WNBA has been a long been around for a long time, hmm. but women haven't been able to make that what they do. You know, they have to go off and play in Europe or in China or Russia in the off season because that's where they actually make their money. Mm. and well what happens as a result of that well if you're playing year round for 10 years you're more prone to injury yeah you're not going to be able to play as long you're not going to be able to save as much money um or they coach in the off season mm. because that's just what they have to do mm. and and we're still there we are still there 25 years later where these women can't just well us i shouldn't say that a very small percentage of them can mm. but the majority of them cannot mm. so okay. I want to look into this though. I'm like really curious. We also have, ho I mean, we have hockey here. The National Women's Hockey League was around for six years, maybe uh, starting in like 2015 ish. And okay. they recently just rebranded. They are the premier hockey federation now. Mm -hmm. They're in their, they're in their first year. They just, um, I think they have broadcast rights with ESPN plus. They received some major, major investment recently. Um, but I, they, 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 they're sustaining because they're, um, they're pretty clustered. We're, we're mostly the Northeast, like Buffalo, New York, Boston, Massachusetts, Hartford, Connecticut, um, New Jersey. So there's not as much expense on flights and travel, et cetera, as there are other leagues that are uh, bi-coastal. Right. Um, but they're going to be an interesting one to study if you wanted to say, Hall, because they're like, they're, they're, the mo they're the one that's in their most infancy. So out of curiosity, are the men's and women's uh, teams branded the same or are they branded separate? No. Okay. No. The, uh, the NHL teams in Boston, for example, are the Boston Bruins and uh -huh. the PHF team is the Boston Pride. Uh -huh. um, Connecticut, the Connecticut Whale is the women's team. We don't have an uh, NHL team in Connecticut. We did um, when I was very young, like early 90s, we had the Hartford Whale. Mm -hmm. But they are they have they have since um, they don't exist anymore. Okay. So yeah, they're all different. They are individually funded and invested in. So right. So they're run by separate organizations, separate who are completely separate financially. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let me go that quick. I'm pretty sure they are. That would be like. Yeah, there it is. Premier Hockey Federation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is, um, it's interesting to think about, you know, having grown up for, you know, 30 plus 32 years, like in this, to think, you know, from the perspective of someone who
who doesn't live in the U.S., it, it could it could seem like we've grown really fast mm. and been around and been around forever. But it's really it's really the tip of the iceberg. It really goes back to like the '70s. If you wanted mm -hmm. to kind of really really look at it, um, let me see here. The league was established in 2015. Ba, ba, ba. Let's see this. League beginning structural changes and NHL partnerships. Here we go. Mm -hmm. Trying to see. So in 2017, the New Jersey Devils, which is the NHL team out of New Jersey, they partnered with the New Jersey Riveters which mm -hmm. is the women's PHF team. Mm -hmm. They were the first NHL team to partner with an NWHL team. It was only a three-year partnership though. So that ended in 2020. Buffalo team is owned by a sports entertainment company. No affiliation. Mm. It seems like, it looks like the New Jersey Devils are the only NHL partnership that has existed. Mm. I suppose one of the uh, critical differences in uh, kind of the way I'm looking at it and uh, the way the things exist in the US is in India, most sports are centrally controlled by one body, uh, usually uh, a body that's affiliated to the government and uh, gets funding from the government. Uh, cricket is- All like, sports? Uh, all sports, yeah. All just cricket. Cricket. No, cricket is the exception. Oh, wow. Cricket, not, uh, cricket has become so financially uh, the outlier that it does not need government money uh, but pretty much every other sport uh, relies uh, to a great extent uh, the federations that run the sport rely to a great extent on government infrastructure on government investment um, and then they are the one controlling body under which you have both men's and women's competitions running uh, which is why it's probably more common and makes a lot of more sense if you have a, a league under one of these federations uh, for things to be more aligned. Whereas it seems in the US that uh, a lot of these sports are private franchise sports at the top level, not connected to governments or federations that control the sport. I am not sure if there's like a, a federation for soccer in the US, which is the governing body for soccer under which both men's and women's um, soccer leagues will exist. Um, but they seem to be more private enterprises. Is that a correct estimation that's accurate um professional sports leagues here are governed by themselves the federal government does not aid them financially mm -hmm. I, they leagues do leverage it for like arenas and such but they do not need government funding to operate mm -hmm. they are privately operated yeah. um so the national basketball association is run by the nba's board of governors and the owners uh same with the nfl major league soccer Women's sports are a little different. The NWSL has, they have connection to US soccer just in terms of like the players contract structure and trades and things. That's like a nitty gritty thing that I'm not totally um, up to speed on, but I do know it exists. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, professional sports leagues in the United States do not rely on or take funding from the US government. But I think the difference owned. is that your uh, major league soccer and NSWL are not under US soccer. They aren't. No, they operate independently, but they have they have connections somehow. Um, mm -hmm. I can't. Which, which is kind of how the situation exists in cricket. You have one governing body, uh, the BCCI, uh, under which you have men's and women's Indian cricket teams, and uh, the BCCI is the uh, owner of the Indian Premier League of the IPL. Um, so if a women's IPL comes up, it has to be under the BCCI. It can't really be independent of the BCCI, which is uh, kind of the way I see uh, women's or sporting leagues in general in the US existing. So is there is there a reality um, or a uh, is there a reality in India where a women women's sports teams can just sort of be funded themselves, or does it does everything have to go through the government? Um, not through the government. Uh, there is actually a recent court decision which has allowed a um, private volleyball league to run outside of the volleyball federation, 
which controls volleyball, which would be your equivalent of US soccer. They are the ones who, you know, uh, would represent the national team. Uh, without their approval, you can run a private volleyball league is a court battle that has just been won. Um, so now you can have on in theory, private leagues existing without the approval of uh, the parent sporting body. Uh, the government only funds that parent sporting body, but these private leagues, they get their monies from uh, broadcast deals and private sponsors. So in theory, right. you can have that now. Uh, volleyball, I think, is the first sport where this is being tried. All other major um, leagues, franchise leagues for sports in India run uh, under their um, sporting federation. So okay. cricket and kabaddi are two of the biggest examples where you have the uh, PCCI obviously running the Indian Premier League, owning the Indian Premier League. They are licensing out franchises. Um, and similarly, the Kabaddi Federation of India is closely associated with the Pro Kabaddi League, which is the second uh, largest league in India. And what about football? Uh, the football, uh, for football, the... Is there a women's football league? There isn't a thing. Premier League, there isn't a franchise football league for women. Um, so you have a franchise football league for men called the Indian Super League, the ISL. Uh, that too mm -hmm. is run in conjunction with the All India Football Federation as far as I know, but I think Radha would be a better point of uh, to clarify this. But it is connected to uh, the All India Football Federation. Somehow, I'm not exactly sure how. But there is some connection there. Actually, this is something that I should look up. Whether the IS is owned completely privately or uh, it's run in conjunction with the uh, football body. But the football body has a domestic uh, tournament. Okay. And the ISL is a separate franchise tournament. MLS is uh, sanctioned by US, by US soccer. And is N... Uh, S National Women's NWSN? Yes, correct. Ah, okay. Hmm, interesting. But I'm still blown there away. There are by, like, sorry, but I'm, I'm still blown away by the fact that there's no women's American football. I just, I just can't wrap my head around the fact that. <laughs> Me too. How, how, is, how is it possible that no American woman has just thought, okay, we're going to do this. We're just going to start our own association and have our own domestic competitions and do this. I know. It's, um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure that that's, like I said, it has been done in the past. It just, it just wasn't sustainable. Mm. Um, and it is still, it is without question the most, hyper masculine sport in this country for so many so many reasons mm. um if other than the fact that you tackle people um which i know happens in rugby but you know america american football is its own beast um it's just not a sport that women have made their way into i it, I, I will say that i will never in my lifetime see I'm pretty fairly certain of this. We'll see a woman on an NFL roster. Hmm. If it were going, if it were going to happen, there would probably be a separate, a separate women's league. Yeah. Now we've had all kinds of crazy stuff in the U S like we had, there was like a lingerie football league at one point. I saw that. Um, which is, uh, yeah, the, the, the lifespan of women's involvement in the sport of American football is pretty interesting um, on a number of different levels. And that of course was just, you know, that was bred out of wanting to be a cash cow and understanding who the audience was. And yeah. it's probably the worst example of, you know, the, what women's sports could be in the U.S., which is to say that women's sports are only as good as what men perceive them to be. Yeah. So men will only watch the sport if A, B, and C, you know, if they wear this, if, et cetera. Yeah. Um, I think once I think once women's sports really stopped trying to cater to the male consumer mm. is really when their uh, things start to get interesting. Like mm. if you go back on YouTube and look at like early advertisements for the WNBA, mm -hmm. that's what it is. They're like, we need to get men to watch this. Otherwise, 
it's not going to last. You know, mm. what, not enough, not enough women watch sports. And over the last like five years or so, it's gotten extremely inclusive. Um, they have become very vocal about social justice, mm. about um, LGBTQ rights. And so the WNBA is, I think, far and away the most progressive professional sports league in the world, not just women's, yeah. with what they do and what their involvement is. Um, and that's another thing to look at is we've seen over the last two years in this country specifically, viewership has steadily risen for women's sports, but it's kind of teetered out a little bit in men's. Uh -huh. And I think that that's a real reflection on the attitudes of people today you know more progressive minded people are watching women's sports mm. because they are inclusive people and um they just want to see good sports whereas uh generally speaking the demographics watching men's sports don't want to see people kneeling for social justice mm, yeah. so they they're not, they're not watching it as much yeah um they they don't want their sports to infiltrate any other part of their life Mm. They don't want it to make them, they don't want it to make them un uncomfortable. Whereas for women, it's always been uncomfortable. So it's just sort of what we're used to. And it's, you know, it's based in our foundation. Mm. Um, but we, women's sports, I think are a really interesting microcosm and in sort of where the world is going Yeah. in terms of, in terms of attitude um, and just the way we, the way we see things mm. and, and how much bigger can men's sports get, you know, <laughs> have they peaked? I don't know. Are they ever going to peak? Seems like they may have. But but again, people now have to make a choice when they turn on the television here. Yeah. Do I want to watch this NBA game or do I want to watch this WNBA game? For decades and decades, there was not a choice. Yeah. That's um, so. Let me pick up on one of the words uh, that you used, which uh, brings me to a conversation I have here about you know women's uh, leagues being sustainable. Uh, and one of my arguments, especially with the BCCI being out and out the richest sporting body in India, uh, and one of the richest sporting bodies uh, in it definitely the richest sporting body in world cricket, is that it it will cost them literally nothing to invest in women's sport in in women's cricket. Um, that idea on social media gets flipped around a little bit in the sense that there is resentment um, from some male sections of the audience as to why funds which have been generated by the Indian men's cricket team should be given or used for the development of women's cricket, uh, almost like women are riding on the coattails of men in that sense. I don't look at it like that. I look at it as the BCCI is a company. One of those products is the Indian men's cricket team. Why would you not use profits generated by one of your products to invest into R&D and development of a new product, which is the Indian women's cricket team? Why would you not use the money generated by the Indian Premier League, the IPL, the men's IPL, to build a women's IPL and build two products and therefore two revenue sources for, uh, uh, for your business rather than just have one, which, like you said, is kind of peaking and there is a saturation in the market for men's cricket, whereas women's cricket brings so many new storylines, new characters to the fore. Um, now, this, this kind of conversation probably doesn't exist in the US because the men's and women's leagues uh, work with very separate financial uh, backers. Is that correct? Pretty much, but it did, but it, but it did exist in 1972 when Title IX was enacted. There was major, major pushback that, well, if you give money to the women's teams, you're going to lose scholarships for the men. What about what about these boys that aren't going to have scholarships? That was a a very divisive legislation, and it reached a lot of pushback from men at that time because it was almost like women were having their opportunities at the expense of men. Mm. Whereas it really was just a reallocation of the funds that they had, you know, not putting all their eggs in one pot, but trying to make them go equally. Um, in terms of the professional sports leagues, they're independently run. So we don't have any of that, but that, that conversation still exists in large part at the collegiate level, even oh. today, because last year, even though it's, against federal law to, to not um, invest equally in women's and men's um, athletics at the collegiate level. Mm. We had a major incident last year for the men's and women's um, 
basketball tournaments. Mm -hmm. And it was made public that the women's conditions were much worse, were far worse than what the men's were. And since then it has, you know, let off a, a ripple effect of hearings in federal court for the NCAA, the National Collegiate Athletic Association, which governs collegiate sports in the US. Um, they're probably the biggest joke of an institution that ever existed. You can look, you can look them up in your spare time um, uh, or I can do that for you. But uh, that conversation is still happening at the collegiate level. Why don't we invest the same amount of money in men's college sports as we do in women's? And for decades, we'll stick with basketball. So for the college basketball tournaments, for example, were marketed separately. So men were considered March Madness which is like a two, the two week tournament, 64 teams compete. It's like one of the biggest sporting events in the US on an annual uh, level. And the women's were just sort of, you know, it's the women's tournament. Mm. They have since, since the incident last year, they have since dropped the branding for March Madness completely. And they are branding both tournaments as one, uh -huh. which never happened before. That is uh, that was a big, big, big deal. And that only happened because People Someone made it public played. that um, yeah. somebody, they made it public that uh, it was actually one of the players. It was a player, a girl named Sedona Prince, who plays for the University of Oregon. She posted a video of the, the weight room that was made. Oh, yeah, I remember tonight. that. I remember that. This is, this, is all, this is all from that. So they have since, um, they have since had hearings and women's basketball tournament there's the this news changes so fast here it's like oh, so impossible. like i know i've read 10 articles about this but um let me see pretty i'm pretty sure they got rid of march madness so so that's an interesting comparison because in college sports i mean both the men's and women's team are playing for the same brand you're playing for the same university um so that's probably the closest comparison you can have to what's happening or what we hope will happen in women's cricket or what's happening with cricket in the uk and australia where men's and women's team are playing for the same club or for the same uh, franchise uh, so so college sports actually have that already existing where you have the men's right. and women's teams playing for the same brand and exactly that might be the best comparison so does that actually have there been examples where that uh, helps the women's teams. I mean, this obviously, Title IX is one of those examples where you have funds coming in to both men and women's teams. But uh, this alignment um, of college sports, uh, I wonder if it helps the women's teams in some way, or maybe it doesn't help. I don't know. Uh, well, first of all, they did. Um, I was incorrect. They are going to use. They're going to use the March Madness branding for the women's tournament too. So they're using it for both now, which they haven't previously been doing. Which is, I mean, which um, is the most sensible thing to do. Which is huge. Yeah. yeah. But for example, I mean, college sports, as I mentioned, are a major, major money maker. So I'll mm -hmm. just use university in my home state, University of Connecticut. Mm -hmm. the, football pro the football programs in college sports are the big money drivers. Yeah. Regardless of how good your basketball or soccer teams are, football is the major, major money driver for collegiate sports in the U.S. Okay. So about six years ago six years ago so each school this is um, so much information for you each school is part of a conference and yeah. so they compete in a conference so for example UConn competes in the Big East so we play the same 15 teams home and away mm -hmm. and then we pepper in like non-conference games for okay. with whoever we want so six or seven years ago uh, UConn was dominating the Big East we've always been a Big East school in order for the football team to be more competitive, the entire school left the Big East and joined a lesser conference. And despite the men's and women's basketball teams being the most successful sports teams at the university, mm -hmm. they had to go to. So they were playing lesser competition for six or seven years, scrambling to find really hard non-conference opponents for that period of time. Until recently, we moved back to the Big East. Mm. So. Football still kind of football. It's not like it so could help. All the sports hurt. programs had to move. Yeah, they moved to the American Athletic Conference, which is like the biggest joke of a conference ever. You couldn't just um, move the football program. No, yeah. it's just the. I guess it's. I guess it's the way the. It must be NCAA rules, or there's some must be some rule against it. But that's an example of like another sport 
hurting other sports. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, that's that's a pretty large level, but um, I mean, for the most part, you know, the men's and women's teams play in the same place. Mm. Like the basketball teams in Connecticut, they both play at Gamble Pavilion. They both mm. play at the XL Center in Hartford. Mm. There's not a separate place for them to play. They drive the same fans and uh, same cetera, fans. Cetera. Is yep, it's big. Yeah, big deal. It's a big deal. Yeah, college sports that'll keep you up for like weeks. You'll be you'll be in the weeds researching U.S. the U.S. collegiate sports system. Yeah, I am definitely looking. It's pretty that. wild. But I hadn't made the connection to you said that. I think that might be the closest closest to uh to the sports structures um in India. Yeah. So but I just think it would be cool to see different types of different typologies starting to pop up in different parts of the world. Like I would like, would it even be possible for you and I, like if you and I hit the lottery, if we just were like, we're going to start a women's team in England, like, what would they do? Would we even be allowed? Like who, who would have to vote us in? Like, is there, I don't even know how that would work. Oh, what would, they, would they even allow it? Soccer, right? Like we wouldn't be part of any team. We'd have our own team, yeah. we would call it whatever. Like, is that even, they wouldn't even know what to do because it's never happened before. They've always just done what the men do. Yeah, if you take, if you take uh, American, uh, the way Americans do things to England, you're going to shake things up over there. I did. We call it soccer. They can't even get over that. Um, I talked to Rod about this because of the uh, structure and at LAFC. I was like, I mean, it sounds like a joke, but, you know, why aren't there any actresses in England, like, banding together with former soccer players starting their own franchise? Like, can they do that? Has anybody done it? Why isn't it happening? Why are, why is everybody just... I think that's one of the things that has always impressed me about um, just sports in the US, especially women's sports is we just, we don't do what everyone expects us to do. Mm. We always, we always, um, you know, challenge the status quo. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really, even on such, even on a micro scale, it's hard for me to see things happen. Um, we'll just use England as an example. And it's, it's strange for me to not see athletes like be very vocal oh. about things that happen because I grew up with, like yeah. I said, Billie Jean King in 1972 refused yeah. to play in the US Open because she wasn't paid enough. So that's yeah. like embedded in me as a human, as an American woman. That's mm -hmm. what I know. Yeah. We don't just sit back and do what we're supposed to do. Like, and I know that's not, it might, in the way I perceive this traditionally American, it's more embedded as more of a woman thing in general. We just, we've always had to, we've always had to fight. We had to yeah. fight and strap. I mean, I joke, I'm like, I'm a woman. So half of the population already is pissed off. <laughs> you, know, my, um, you know what I mean? So, but it's, it's strange to see that because mm. all the athletes I've ever had growing up and even more so now, they yeah. say what they think. They challenge their team owners yeah. publicly. They demand better constantly. It's, I don't see that anywhere else. And I, I wish that we did. Hopefully we will soon. That's something I'm really envious of when I look at uh, sports in the US, especially women's sports in the US, uh, is that this hierarchy and power structure is constantly challenged. Whereas especially in India, the power structure is so built in, the hierarchy is so, uh, so oppressing. I'm just going to use that word um, mm -hmm. that these players I mean, it will ruin their careers if they speak out. And it has ruined careers of players who have been vocal before. And it's only now in the men's team that we are seeing a couple of top players really be vocal about things and not um, play to the tune of the administrators. But otherwise, the power uh, dynamics in India make it pretty much impossible for athlete activism to exist. Um, the activism, I was explaining this actually to a room of uh, people in the US uh, who were thinking about making a documentary on Indian women's cricket and they were asking me, where's the athlete activism? I was like, the, act the activism comes from people like me. The activism comes from people like in the media who um, we see something and we can't not say that, you know, what's happening isn't cool. What ha what's happening sh should not happen. And it's sometimes frustrating that the athletes themselves who are the most powerful voices uh, don't join in that conversation but I having been uh, a former athlete I sympathize I sympathize with them because you know you don't bite the hand that feeds you and uh, considering like I said the structure is such that there is only one uh, federation where you can earn your uh, bread you're not going to I mean very few athletes are going to put themselves in that position 
I know. I mean, I still, that's why I still think Billie Jean King is like the biggest. She's our figure over here. And yeah, in 1996, after after 1995, the women's national soccer team. Um, I saw it in the documentary. I read about it before, but uh, the details. They their contracts were up, or their collective bargaining agreement was up, and what they were being offered was not good enough. Mm. And um, I remember hearing Julie Foudy uh, spoke about, they spoke to Billie Jean King, you know, 25 mm-hmm. years after she boycotted the US Open. And she yeah. said, you have to use your power. Yeah. So they didn't, they didn't show up for an Olympic camp mm. because they knew, they knew what was at stake. They, yeah. they knew that they could maybe be kicked off the team. Maybe they couldn't. They really didn't know. They didn't know how much leverage they had until they did it. Yeah. And it worked. And that's, that's what it has taken time and time again, at least over here. Yeah. One of the big differences with uh, uh, how sports is structured uh, in India and um, other countries, especially UK and Australia, are my reference points, is that there are no player associations in India. There's no independent body representing the players. That's a great are... point. I never thought of that. Yeah, there's, there's no player associations. The, the governing body for cricket, the governing body is so strong that they don't allow a player association to exist and have been attempts on the men's side to create player associations and, you know, cool player power a little bit. But then those attempts are kind of dismantled by the administration. Um, and so there is no, there is no one in your corner to take stands like this. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I think oppressive is the right word. Yeah. Um, have you been following what's been going on in the NWSL too? I mean, yes, the uh, I Players Association, they've been making like some really detailed statements in regards to what they're demanding uh, from NWSL ownership and the governing body. Mm. And uh, that just seems to be historically, in my memory, the only way that women can really get anything is yeah. if they demand it. Otherwise, it's just we take what we, what people give us, we just assume is what we're worth and what we're allowed. And so we say thank you and we come back again the next time. Yep. Um, and it's a, uh, it's really, I think sports is, sports is the arena where I've seen it the most in my life. I don't know about you in terms of women just like standing up. Like I said, I mean, we don't have as many role models as we want, as we need uh, in terms of the activism front. Who was your, uh, who was your uh, female role model? Start off uh, athlete growing up did you have any so my female role model my at, the athlete role model was julian goswami but she was my role model from the skill excellence point of view not from the activism oh, okay i see yeah so she was who i wanted to be she was who i wanted to bowl like and she's mm-hmm. and she's a wonderful human being and i'm lucky to call her my friend and uh, you know i want to be like her yes but there aren't any female activists i look at people in the media right now who are really putting their jobs on the line to talk against the power structures. And I think these are women who I really look up to right now. And those role mm-hmm. models exist more in the media than they do uh, in on the player side. And I look at a uh, few people who are really uh, putting in a lot of effort with different solutions to fund and grow the sports ecosystem. And I think these are the people who I really want to work with. And these are the people who I want to learn from. So those mm-hmm. role models uh, off field, Role models for off-field reasons exist off-field, if that makes sense. Gotcha. Yep. Mm-hmm. They're outside of the field of competition. Yeah. So let me let me flip that question around. Uh, who are your uh, female role models, or just role models in general? So I asked. Um, I had a chat last week with a woman who writes for uh, Front Office Sports. Mm-hmm. She writes about like sports business, and. Uh, I was, I was born in the 80s, as I mentioned. So I'm from a generation where I've sort of seen the whole, pretty much the predominant history of uh, professional women's sports leagues in the US. So I asked her, who was your favorite athlete growing up and who is it now? Because for a lot of us growing up, it was male athletes <laughs> because that's all that we had. Mm. So, I mean, growing up, my favorite male athletes were Michael Jordan and Derek Jeter because that's who I saw. You know, I'm from Connecticut. I live like an hour and 20 minutes outside of Manhattan. So I'm a New York sports fan, mostly because we don't have sports in Connecticut. <laughs> so if you're from Connecticut, you're either a Boston fan okay, um, or, you're, or, New, or you're New York. 
for the most part. There's some uh, some strange people peppered in there, but uh, for the most part, you're a Boston or a New York fan. So when I was growing up, those were my favorite athletes. Like I love, Michael Jordan is still, I love Michael Jordan. Mm. I've watched The Last Dance. Mm. Um, I think I'm on my fifth rewatch of The Last Dance. <laughs> I absolutely, I, it's like a, I don't know. It's like a gospel for me. I just think he is uh, unmatched in every way, but female athletes were, um, it's kind of a complex answer. I apologize for taking so long to answer, but um, at the, co- at the collegiate level, that's the thing. So we don't just have professional, we have collegiate and professional sports. Right. So in the state of Conne- in the state of Connecticut, we have the most decorated and winningest women's basketball team in the country. Mm-hmm. They have won 11 national championships since 1995. Mm-hmm. Um, I was six years old when I watched the first one. Mm-hmm. So my first real, you know, sports hero was Rebecca Lobo, who played on that 95 team. She's now a premier analyst for ESPN. She calls a lot of college and WNBA games. Um, she was also really tall, and I'm mm-hmm. 5'11", so I like, oh, me too. <laughs> I geared towards athletes, really, I geared towards athletes yeah. who are really, really tall. So like everybody on that team, Rebecca Lobo, Jen Rosati, uh Nikisha Sales they were my heroes and then the Yukon the women who played for that program as I got older have been mm. so Diana Taurasi Sue mm. Bird um, Maya Moore they're all Yukon women's players mm-hmm. and then on the professional side and well, of course now they're professionals so I still am fans of theirs now the professional side it would be Mia Hamm for the mm. 99 World Cup team so there's the basketball aspect and the soccer aspect because those those were the most visible to me Right. The 96 Olympics and the 99 World Cup. So mm-hmm. Mia Hamm, Christine, Christine Lilly, who's from my home state, she grew up okay. 30, min- 30 minutes south of me. Um, I've had the privilege to speak to her before She's and meet her. She's fantastic. Um, but yeah, those are those are my guys. And I, it's, you know, and I grew up with that stupid slang, but those are those are my athletes. Um, the 99 World Cup team and then, you know, UConn women's basketball players. Nice, nice. Nice. Super. Um, so this has been a really, really interesting chat. I mean, um, just before this conversation, I thought, you know, I, I generally have these conversations. I look for these conversations with random people who are interesting and have perspectives that on sport, usually women's sport that I don't. Like my last conversation was one on a, with a, a female trek leader. Uh, and I went on a Himalayan trek recently and I, I saw a woman trek leading there. And I thought I have to talk to her. Um, but I'm, I'm just going to use the hashtag. I learned a lot because I learned a lot. Uh, <laughs> so thank That's you so awesome. For, uh, I learned a lot from you too. Thank yeah. You. If you, um, if you want to do it again, let me know. Just um, give me like a week or so in advance and I can actually do some, some research for you because I'm, I'm interested in myself, but I am um, stay home. I'm hundred percent open to uh, do this again. If you, if you would like to. Yeah, definitely. Uh, do send me anything you can, which you would, you feel would be helpful in uh, a beginner's resource to college sports in the U- U.S. Sure thing. I have people you could talk to as well. I can send you, uh, I'll reach out and send you some names. So you, are you working on articles though, or is this just personal research? No, this is just personal research. This is just um, okay. stuff that I, I want to make time for to kind of widen my scope because I kind of live in a cricket bubble. I don't know a lot about other <laughs> sports, even in India. Um, so I find it always very interesting to talk to people from other sports and see how do things, how they do things. And talking to people from the US is always like a completely different conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and um, it is. It's interesting when you talk about it. You know, we're never just really talking about sports, right? Mm-hmm. We're talking about gender and society and politics. Yeah. Um, it's very layered and intricate and oftentimes those don't exist without the other so um yeah interesting chat and uh yeah i will send you what i can i'll do some digging i'll reach out to some people um i know shannon for shannon scoble would be more than happy to chat with you she's the one that's doing her phd in uh gender equity in sports media Mm -hmm. um uh, maddie Maddie Salomon is a, is a lawyer, but she specializes in NIL. Um, and so she under she understands like on a minutia scale, like the NCAA and yeah. the structures of college sports. Yeah. Um, if that's interesting for you, um, I'll reach out to them and then 
if I find links to like documentaries or articles, I'll uh, I'll shoot them your way. Definitely cool. Let me just stop recording on this.